Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Um, if you prayed for the rain and you were tired of it, sorry about you. Um, I'm very grateful. I would take a little bit more. I'm still welcoming. Anytime you get extra rain in July or the 1st of August, great news. Really, really good. So um, grateful for that. I also want to say um, we had a great time this last week um, doing ministry and, and working with the Boys and Girls Club and, and doing vacation Bible school there. It was um, quite an exciting event. Uh, we didn't really know 100% what it was going to look like and what we were walking into, but it was um, it was a great time. We we taught the kids a little bit of Hebrew, and uh, which is a good thing for every kid, I think, um, to learn a little bit of Hebrew. And uh, we taught we taught them one word in Hebrew, and it was yada to know. And so we just talked about um, getting to know God and and why she why we should want to know who God is and why God wants to get to know who, who we are. And so it was a good time. We really enjoyed it and uh, we look forward to potentially being able to do it again. Um, we are going to continue uh, in Amos today. So we're going to be in Amos chapter nine. I don't know if you've never read the book of Amos. There's a, there's a passage in there in, in Amos seven and eight that talks about, or six and seven, that talks about a plumb line. This is my crude plumb line. Again, it has been resurrected for this week. Um, so if you ever think about, uh, it's good to remember to have different mnemonic devices and memory devices for what uh, what certain books of the Bible and, and understanding what it's about. And, and if we think of the book of Amos, we really should think about the plumb line. I mean, that is really the, the primary image of the book of Amos, um, this image of the plumb line. And if, if we understand the plumb line, it is what tells us whether something is straight and true, whether it is, um, as they say, true to plumb, whether it is vertically sound, um, often used in construction. So what did we see? We saw God say he was going to judge his people, judge the, the nation of, of Israel. And he showed Amos what he was going to do. And Amos pleads with God and says, please don't, please stop. God, forgive us um, because Jacob is small. And if you do this, how can he stand? How can he, how can he survive? And God says, okay, I won't do that. I, I will relent. And then God shows him another calamity that's coming and that he was going to consume Israel with fire and consume uh, the nation with fire. And, and Amos pleads with God and says, please relent, God. Please, no, forgive us. Um, and don't do this. Don't let this happen. And, and God says, for your sake, for your pleading, I will, I will relent. Then God shows Amos this plumb line. And he says, what is this? And he says, it's a plumb line. He says, behold, I'm hanging my plumb line in the center of my nation. And I'm not coming back anymore. And I'm going to leave it there. And here's what's interesting. Amos doesn't plead with God to stop. Amos doesn't plead with God to stop after this. Because now that the measure of what holiness and godliness looks like stands next to this wall, this nation of Israel that God has established and the rules and the standards that God has set and how they measure against it, Amos relents and doesn't fight against God anymore. And this seems to be a pretty harsh position to put ourselves in, isn't it? Like surely this is not all that God would do. Like if, it, 
it seems pretty ruthless for somebody to go, well, here's the standard. I'm leaving. If you can't measure up to this standard, you're destined for destruction and I can't do anything for you. But isn't this often how we treat other people? Like this is the, this is the, uh, we're in the process of, of, of building. This is really the building code, right? Like if you have, if you're building a house and the code inspector says, hey, this isn't to code, this is what the code is. Either meet that code or we, you can't move past this spot in the construction. This is where you're stuck. It feels like that's what God is saying. I am hanging my plumb lines, telling you what the code is, what the expectation is, what the standard is. And you can either meet it and continue to move forward or you're not going to meet it. And this is where it ends. This is where you end. Does that seem a little harsh, a little hard? Is this really the heart of God? Well, in Amos chapter 9, this is what Amos sees. Did I say that? I, I hope I said that. Amos chapter 9. we That's where the plumb line is. Anyway, okay, Amos chapter 9. I saw the Lord standing beside the altar, and he said, Strike the capitals until the thresholds shake. Now, the capitals would have been in the top of the pillars, the, the top of the, um, the temple, and the thresholds would have represented the base of the pillars and the structure of the, of the temple. So God is making this declaration to, for his people, for his for for the angels, for a better lack of a better term, strike the capitals until the thresholds shake, until the whole foundation and the whole structure of the temple is shaken, even broken, and shatter them on the heads of all the people, and those who are left of them I will kill with the sword, not one of them shall flee away and not one of them shall escape. It's pretty dark times. It even says if they dig into Sheol, if they dig a depth and dig a hole to try to hide themselves, he says, I'm going to find them there. For there shall my hand take them. If they climb up to heaven from there, I will bring them down. If they hide themselves on the top of Mount Carmel, from there I will search them out and take them. And if they hide from my sight at the bottom of the sea, there I will command the serpent and it shall bite them. And if they go into captivity before their enemies, there I will command the sword and it, will, it shall kill them. And I will fix my eyes upon them, not like Jeremiah, but for evil and not for good. This is on the back of the plumb line. God says, I'm setting my plumb line. I'm stepping out of the way. And if you don't measure up, this is what's coming. Like, this is hard to handle, isn't it? Like if we really understand what's going on, God says, if you're disobedient, if, you're, if you don't meet my standard, if you, if you claim to be my people but don't walk in my ways, then you can go hide in any place that you want, but it's not going to hide you from certain destruction. It says, The Lord God of hosts, He who touches the earth and it melts, and all who dwell in it mourn. And all of it rises like the Nile and sinks again like the Nile of Egypt. Who builds his upper chambers in the heavens and founds his vaults upon the earth. Who calls for the waters of the sea and pours them out 
upon the surface of the earth. The Lord is his name. Are you not like the Cushites to me, O people of Israel, declares the Lord? Did I not bring up Israel from the land of Egypt? and the Philistines from Kaftor, and the Syrians from Kerr. Behold, the eyes of the Lord God are upon the sinful kingdom, and I will destroy it from the surface of the ground, except that I will not utterly destroy the house of Jacob, declares the Lord. For behold, I will command and shake the house of Israel among all the nations, as one shakes the sieve, and no pebble shall fall to the earth. All the sinners of my people shall die by the sword who say disaster shall not overtake or meet us. Yay. Should we just pray now and get it over with? Like, what is going on here? God's call, God places the plumb line and He's calling His people to repent. And he's constantly called his people to repent and they refuse. Because their luxury and their nice life and all the things that are going well, they're like, nothing can hurt us because we're God's people, even though we don't live like it. Even though we don't act like it. Even we don't, even though our life doesn't reflect his name and his his care. And here's what we we have to remember that God's call to the people through Amos was, you have forgotten the value of these other people among you. You forgot about the lost. You forgot about the needy. You forgot about the people who who find themselves in a position that they can't get themselves out of. And they need help. So often... We justify, well, I would help them, but they made the choices they made to get themselves there. and They can make the choices they need to make to get them out. Most often, all that's going to happen is they don't know. They don't know a better way. Um, there was a group of people at the University of Tulsa about the time that I was going to school there. They convinced the school to let them do a grad study and uh, their capstone, their graduate study was let us live homeless. So they were allowed to not live on campus. They were allowed to not have a a uh, a meal plan. They lived as as a couple of homeless people close to downtown Tulsa for six months. And the only way they could survive, the only way they could live, was to beg for money, to ask for money, to ask for help, to ask people for help constantly. Then they got done and they came back and they were finishing up their last semester and here's what they said. That six months of living without and living homeless and asking for stuff and and begging for stuff, they had lost all inhibition. When they had money in their pocket, they couldn't help but spend it. Their body, their mind, their heart had been trained to have no understanding, no care about the consequences, of, especially financial consequences. So every time they had extra and they saw something that they wanted, they had no inhibition to say no. It took them years to get over that, of being back in a different place of changing their surroundings, changing their their patterns and their habits. Years. The challenge is for us, most people who are homeless and helpless or, or hurting or are in bad relationship situations, yes, they've made decisions and they've found themselves here. Yes, things have been bad. Yes, they may have been in a cycle that has left them right here, but they don't know how to help themselves out of it. They need someone to come alongside them to help change the scenery. See, I I, I, I say it this way. One of two things. People change because they have a change of heart or they have a change of scenery. That's the easiest way for people to change. A change of heart or a change of scenery. And if you're homeless and helpless and the scenery doesn't change, 
It's pretty hard to change. And here God has established His people. The people of, of Israel have been established. The people of God have been established in Israel as a nation. They went from wandering around in the desert and He planted them at the crossroads of the world so that everyone in all the world would be blessed because of them. You know what happens when you're planted and you have a permanent home? Scenery doesn't change. So the only way for things to change is to change a heart. That's it. It's not like I moved from one side of town to the other side of town and everything changed. Well, you still live in the same town. You know what the difference between one side of Noah and the other side of Noah is? Less than a mile. The scenery a mile apart. I like that. The scenery a mile apart, not significantly different. If you move from this side of town to that side of town, the chances of you going to a different gas station to get gas, pretty slim. Even though there are plenty of options here in town. The potential of you going to a different place to get groceries, pretty slim because there's one option if you're shopping in town. One option. So the only other option is a change of heart. The only other option, if, if, if we're reaching people in our community to help them transform, to help them be restored, to be redeemed, to be back into a right relationship with God, or even aware that God cares about them, we have to come alongside them and help them change their scenery and change their routine. It takes work. This group of people, God is warning and warning and warning. They're not listening. Listen, you can say all the things you want to a random person passing by. There is a person, there are multiple people actually, um, here in town that make rotations between dumpsters, sifting through large dumpsters in town, looking for I don't know what. They're doing construction across the street, and evidently somebody figured out, hey, there's a little bit of drywall that they've been throwing out as scraps that evening. Truck drives up with a big... Trailer on it, has a few different things on the trailer. Guy jumps in the big 30-yard dumpster and starts handing out quarter, half sheets, smaller pieces of drywall, and they're stacking them up. They're going to use them for something. And you can be like, well, drywall is not that expensive. It depends on your standard of living. It depends on your income. It depends on the project that you have. It depends on the commitments that you have. Like, I'm just saying, there's an old saying, one man's trash is another man's treasure. But if it's in a dumpster and you're chasing it, then it's on us. Because these people are ours. These people God has planted in our community. Right beside us. And it's easy for us to look at the, at the wayward and those people who are dumpster diving and chasing stuff and, and doing without and go, well, if they would just repent and get to know God, but... That's not the call of Amos. Amos isn't talking to those who are lost. He's talking to the people of God. Hey, if you would just recognize those people and understand that they have a name and a story, and it could be the rest of their story, Paul Harvey, could be redemption. 
It could be restoration. Because where I stopped is not the end of the story. Amos chapter 9 is the end of the book of Amos. It's the end of the declaration of God through Amos. And it doesn't start with these people are all going to die by the... It doesn't stop with these people are all going to die by the sword who said disaster's not going to overcome me and I'm never going to see it because I'm God's. No, no. Chapter 9 starts with God declaring that He's going to shake and break the temple. This permanent structure. And He's going to break it on the people who are there, claiming that it's something that it's not. And verse 11 picks up in Amos chapter 9. It says, In that day I will raise up the booth of David that is fallen. The tent of David. That is fallen. It's not his, God is saying that that permanent structure and all its glory is going to be destroyed, but this thing that is frail and weak and torn and in pieces, I'm going to repair it and restore it. Because it's not about strength. It's not about opulence. It's not about how much money we can raise. It's about how Significant a heart change. It is. He says, In that day I'll raise up the booth of David that has fallen. I'll repair its breaches. And I'll raise up its ruins. And rebuild it as in the days of old. That they may possess the remnant of Edom. And all the nations who are called by my name, declares the Lord who does this. See, here's the thing. This declaration from God starts with, I'm going to rebuild this tent. I'm going to rebuild this frail, broken thing. And it's not just going to be the people of Israel. But all nations are going to participate. It's not just the people who say that they're Christians and attend church. No, no. His redemption is offered and His restoration is offered for everyone who would call on His name. Doesn't matter what you look like. Doesn't matter what you dress like. It doesn't matter how much money you make. It matters whether or not Jesus is Lord. And if He's Lord and we're pursuing after Him and He's repairing and restoring, He's restoring us back to the measure of His plumb line. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when the plowman shall overtake the reaper and the treader of grapes, him who sows the seed. The mountain shall drip sweet wine and the hills shall flow with it. And we're like, okay, cool. That's a lot of I don't understand. Anybody else confused by what was just said? Yes. Okay, cool. He's saying that the man who's collecting the harvest is going to be caught by the one who's putting seed in the ground because there's that much fertile soil. There's that much goodness coming from the people of God, the land of God, where he is planting his seed and a harvest follows it. And we can't keep up with it. This is called revival. That's what revival looks like. That the guy who's collecting and, and, and the people who are coming to get to know him and being drawn into the presence of God are already on the backside laying the foundation and planting the seed of the gospel. And as soon as the, the, the harvester gets to the end, the, the sower is following behind him. And as soon as he completes the harvest, he's got to go back and start harvesting again because it's, the field is ripe and ready. This is the redemption of God. He just cast off and said, declared judgment on His people who refused to be faithful. And He's like, listen, that's not where the story ends. 
That's not where I'm stopping. That's not, like, we get caught in, we read about God's going to bring destruction. He says He's bringing destruction, and we stop and we go, see, the God of the Bible, the God of the Old Testament, He's just angry. But we, we fail to finish the chapter that He says, I'm not going to leave in destruction. I'm going to restore what was there, and it's going to be more plentiful and more productive than it's ever been because the people who are called by my name are putting their hand to the plow and not looking back, and the person behind them is collecting. This sounds a whole lot like 1 Corinthians chapter 3 where Paul says, some of you say you're born of Paul, and some say you're born of Apollos. But Paul planted the seed, and Apollos watered, and the Holy Spirit, God gave the increase. Somebody has to put their hand to the plow and faithfully have the heart of God for other people and see them redeemed. We get caught up in a whole bunch of words and rules and we forget that God is a God of action. He calls us to be about His work. Jesus declares that whatever we do to the least of these, we've done also to Him. His heart is for everyone to find restoration not to be stuck in a place of despair and hurt and pain and continuing to try to cover that pain with chasing after something that will numb the pain. He says, put all those things aside and come to me and I'm going to cast all those things out. I'm going to restore you. I'm going to make you whole again. It's not about whether or not there's a fight going on because we are fighting. I don't care if you're redeemed or not. You're fighting. Because we live in a fallen world. We live in a world that it doesn't matter what standard we set. It doesn't matter where we plant our foot. They're always asking us to compromise a little bit more, compromise a little bit more, until it's not recognizable about where, where it once was. But if we will truly grab hold of the heart of God and the Word of God, it will transform us and we will put our hand to the plow and we will call other people to not meet a standard, but to meet a God who will restore them to that standard. He will make that wall straight. He will make that life straight. He will make that, <clears throat> he will make that heart pure and clean. Because that's His heart. That's His desire. God says, it is my desire that none should perish, that all should come to repentance. That's the heart of God. Where we as the people of God get in, in the way is we stop working. We stop declaring His Word. We stop walking in His ways because, well, I've got this to do and this to do. I just don't have time to... And we make excuses for why... Well, I know this is what we should do, but what we're going to do is this because that's all we can do. But if God says this is what you need to do, then you pursue after it until God makes it possible. The mountains shall drip with sweet wine and the hills will flow with it. I will restore the fortunes of my people Israel and they shall rebuild the ruined cities and inhabit them and they shall plant vineyards and drink their wine and they shall make gardens and eat their fruit and I will plant them on their land and they shall never again be uprooted out of the land that I've given them. We should never again be removed from the presence of the living God. Spoiler alert, wherever you're planted, in whatever part of all the world, the presence of God is there with you. Joshua 1 tells you wherever you put the sole of your foot, wherever the sole of your foot drops, God's already given you the land. God's already given you victory over it. And we want to come into the presence of God begging and pleading, asking God, will you please just help me survive for another day? And he's like, will you come boldly to my throne and ask me to cast that mountain into the sea so you can see what I see, so you can make 
the, the crooked path straight so you can walk the straight and narrow path and find your way to me in victory? Not fighting boulders and, and unnecessary things, but can you just walk the way that I've called you to walk? Will you be bold and assert that I have already given this to you? I have already won this victory. My blood has already been shed. Victory has already been won. Will you walk as victors instead of scrambling like you're just begging to survive? God wants to restore our fortunes. He wants to restore us. And He wants us to be instruments of restoration. We're so busy begging to try to survive. That's not God's Word for us. See, we talked about these challenges of more than enough. And, and the challenge, the main challenge of more than enough is our heart. And God's desire for us is that He could give us more than enough because our heart is set on Him and on His ways. Because He set the plumb line and He set the measure of of what holiness looks like, of what righteousness looks like. And He says, if you'll come to Me, if you'll pursue after Me, I'm going to restore all these things. You're going to be chasing down the supply and, and, and gathering in the supply, and I'm going to be planting it right behind you, chasing you down. And as soon as you have the supplies you need, you're going to turn back around and start gathering supplies for the next thing, and the next thing, and the next thing, because you're going to continually be declaring my word and showing people my heart, and they're going to get to know me. That's God's heart. Not that they would get to know Pastor Kirk. That's not what I'm saying. Don't hear that. That they would get to know God through you. That they would get to know the provision, the power, the freedom, the light that is God because of you and because of me. And that we would continually call them not to, hey, get off your butt and do something. But our call would be continually to get to know who God is and he'll take care of all these other things. Isn't that what the New Testament says? When he says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all of these other things are going to be added unto you. All these other things are going to be taken care of. Our problem is we get so focused on all these other things, we forget about the kingdom of God. I mean, I've got a mortgage I've got to, take care, I've got to get taken care of. I can't afford to be at church on Wednesday night. Cool. I, I've, I've got things I've got to take care of. I, I mean, these kids need my help. They, they need my attention, and, and, and if we don't have time to, to decompress on Sunday morning, okay. And then when something goes wrong, God, I need help. Do you guys know anybody? Do you, oh, okay, the Bible says seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things are going to be taken care of. God's call. God's call to us in the character of God is that when our life, when our actions don't meet the standard of His holiness, He provides for our restoration. He provided the blood of Jesus for our restoration. In the book of Amos, there was no gap. There was no, well, then my people are going to offer all of these sacrifices and they're going to be, there was, hey, this is the destruction that's coming, but in that same day, I'm going to rebuild the tent, the booth of David. I'm going to restore the heart of my people for me. And I'm going to restore their land. I'm going to draw them back home. And they're going to build permanent places in my presence. And they're never going to leave again. Because their heart's going to be set on me. And all that other stuff is going to be a blessing. And they're going to bless all these other people because of it.
This is the restoration of God. Psalm 85. Psalm 85, I think, communicates what's going on here as good as any way that I could communicate it. Psalm 85 verse 1 says, Lord, you are favorable to your land and you restored the fortunes of Jacob. You forgave the iniquity of your people and you covered all their sin. It says this strange word, Selah, that we should stop and reflect. That God, I was nothing. I was wayward. I was sinful. I was full of what your word says calls iniquity. But you forgave me. You covered up all that sin, all that nastiness, and here I am. Because of God's forgiveness, what happens? He says in verse 3, you, re- you withdrew all your wrath and you turned from your hot anger. Isn't this what happens in Amos chapter 9? Restore us again, O God, of our salvation and put away your indignation toward us. Will you be angry with us forever? Will you prolong your anger to all generations? Isn't that how we feel like 10 minutes into anything that's hard? God, this uh, this is never going to end. Verse 6, will you not revive us again? that your people may rejoice in you. Show us your steadfast love, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. Let me hear what God the Lord will speak, for He will speak peace to His people, to His saints. But let them not turn back to folly. This is the call of God. God, forgive me. And He says, you're forgiven. You're restored. You're remade. You're redeemed. Just don't don't turn back to your folly. This is the declaration of Jesus. He says, your sin has made you free. Your sin, or your sin, your faith has set you free. Now go and sin no more. And we're like, well, good luck with that. (laughs) Then why did he tell him not to do it? Why would God give an instruction to us that we can't meet? Anyway. But this is exactly what Jesus does, isn't it? In response to our iniquity and our failure and, and, and our fight, we call on God to revive us, to redeem us, to restore us. And He speaks peace to us. And then he says, let them not turn back to folly. Surely his salvation is near to those who fear him. That glory may dwell in our land. Steadfast love and faithfulness meet. And righteousness and peace kiss each other. And faithfulness springs up from the ground. And righteousness looks down from the sky. And yes... The Lord will give what is good and our land will yield its increase and righteousness will go before him and make his footsteps away. I believe this is God's heart for no water. This should be our prayer for no water. For ourself and for our community. That this character of God That in spite of all of the hardships, in spite of all of the challenges, in spite of all of the failures, that God would look down and speak peace over us 
and restore us and restore the brokenhearted. Use us to mend the brokenhearted, to restore right relationship, to see people redeemed and set free. That this land, that this land would be a place of revival. That this land would be a place that people seek out because it's so fertile. Because the power of God is moving so much that there's nothing like it. This isn't happening anywhere else that we know of. So we had to be here. This is our mission. This is our mission. To pursue after the presence of God, to be redeemed and restored ourselves. And to cause others to find their way to restoration and redemption. This is our mission because it's the heart of God. Echoed over and over. Echoed over and over in the Gospels. That we would seek God first. That we would seek God first. And because of Him, because of our relationship with Him, because of the work of speaking peace over us, all of these things, all of these things would be added to our life as a blessing. So we're going to enter into a time of worship. And I just challenge you. Don't let the call of God, don't let the plumb line of God just be a thing that's hanging in your window or hanging on the wall that says, hey, I'm measuring up to the standard of God today. Let it be a stirring of the Holy Spirit that draws you close. And if there's need for repentance, find an altar and repent. Let the worship team sing all the words with us face down pursuing after God. But there is nothing, nothing that will replace the presence of God of a repentant heart. So will you find a place to make much of who God is? Chelsea's going to read Psalm 18 as we enter into, enter into this time of worship. And it's long and you're going to have plenty of time to reflect on the word of God. But he's calling us to be restorers. To be people that cause others to be redeemed and brought back into a relationship with him. Will you answer the call? I will love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. My God, my strength and whom I will trust. My shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from my enemies. The pains of death surrounded me and the floods of ungodliness made me afraid. The sorrows of Sheol surrounded me. The snares of death confronted me. In my distress, I called upon the Lord and cried out to my God. He heard my voice from his temple, and my cry came before him, even to his ears. Then the earth shook and trembled. The foundations of the hills also quaked and were shaken, because he was angry. Smoke went up from his nostrils and devouring fire from his mouth. Coals were kindled by it. He bowed the heavens also and came down with darkness under his feet, and he rode upon a cherub and flew. He flew upon the wings of the wind. He made darkness his secret place. His canopy around him was dark waters and thick clouds of the skies. From the brightness before him, his thick clouds passed with hailstones and coals of fire. 
The Lord thundered from heaven, and the Most High uttered his voice, hailstones and coals of fire. He sent out his arrows and scattered the foe, lightnings in abundance, and he vanquished them. Then the channels of the sea were seen. The foundations of the world were uncovered. At your rebuke, O Lord, at the blast of the breath of your nostrils. He sent from above. He took me. He drew me out of many waters. He delivered me from my strong enemy, from those who hated me, for they were too strong for me. They confronted me in the day of my calamity, but the Lord was my support. He also brought me out into a broad place. He delivered me because he delighted in me. 